Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I sat down with my good friend Nicole Edmonds and we walked through how to put together really creative deals. This deal that Nicole had had so many elements to it. It was an underperforming property that a lot of other investors had passed up. She brought in a joint venture money partner. They were also able to secure a cash back on closing. They kept some of the tenants in place in order to generate some income while they were renovating. They did a cash out refinance after the renovation was complete based on the new value. And after all that, they've got a cash flowing property with all new tenants that Nicole was able to vet and put in place. And it's been a great property for her and her partner moving forward. So as you'll see, as investors, we have to think outside the box and find opportunities where others may have passed those same properties up. This may require some hard work and some creative thinking, but if we can do this, there are some killer deals out there. Before we get into it, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel. You can also hit the notification bell. Please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm with my good friend, Nicole Edmonds. Nicole is a real estate investor that I've known for a couple of years. And I love Nicole's story because she started at a very similar age that, that I did. She started when she was 23 years old. Uh, she's not much older than that now, but she has done a tremendous job of building her real estate portfolio. I'm so glad that she's here with me today. She's gonna talk about a really unique strategy that she was able to implement on a property of hers. Nicole, thanks so much for being here today and I will turn it over to you and you can give uh, your own intro and tell us who you are and how you got into real estate investing. Sure, so thanks very much for having me on your show, Darren. Yeah, so I started investing when I was 23 and when I kind of got exposed to the world of real estate investing, I had no prior experience. I went to school for biology <clears throat> and uh, I had been working downtown Toronto for a year, working a lot, not really making a lot. And uh, my mom actually PVR'd an interview, <clears throat> excuse me, on TV with uh, a real estate investor who started investing with his OSAP money and then amassed a portfolio of properties. And I probably wouldn't have thought twice about it if, you know, it was maybe somebody older who had a bunch of money, but kind of he was where I was. And so I thought, hmm, maybe I could do something like that. And uh, so I went to some training seminars and got some education and uh, learn this concept of buying cash flowing rental properties that supplement your income so that you don't have to work. That sounded really good. So, um, so when I started investing, <clears throat> I started with a student with two student rentals. I think that's because that's what I could stomach uh, was managing students and, and not somebody my parents age as a tenant. <laughs> And then once I got comfortable with that, then I started moving, uh, kind of focusing a little bit more on multi-unit properties. So um, kind of within triplex to fiveplex range is where I focused. And then the one, um, the case study that I brought today is a, an eightplex. <clears throat> but I didn't start with a lot of money. I, so I needed to bring in financial partners. I needed to borrow down payments um, and do some different creative things so that I could get into the real estate game without having that capital. Um, so that's what I mostly focused on. And now that I've, I've done the property thing, I've now moved some money into more passive deals and been kind of on the flip, flip side of that. Let's jump right in. Let's talk about this property you brought and I want you to tell us a little bit about it and, and give us some backstory and then we'll, we'll jump into the numbers. Well, okay. So this property is an eight flex. Um, it's probably the biggest renovation project that I've done. Uh, it had been listed for about a year. This property was completely underperforming. Like it needed full renovation. Um, outside, it did not look good. And inside, it was, I would say, unrentable. Two units of the eight units were actually tenanted um, when I bought it. Like it, it absolutely needed a renovation. And so because of that, um, I think I got a pretty good price on it. Uh, it was an eightplex that it was listed, I believe it was listed for 565 and I ended up getting it for um, just over five or so for 500k. Which area, Nicole? So it's in Northern Ontario. It's about four hours north of Toronto. I wanted to buy it for around 500. So we negotiated a purchase price of 525 with a 30k cash back at closing. Nice. Okay, so Love that means it. I'm paying 525, but when we're when the lawyers are putting everything through, there's a 30k cash back that comes right back to you. It's an effective 495 purchase price um, with that 30k in hand. So why the 30k on uh, cash cash back? Why not just a purchase price of 495 to get your leverage, your loan to value is a little bit higher, and then get your some cash in your pocket? Exactly. So it's yeah, it's really interesting if you actually run through numbers and look at if I buy this for 495, how much do I have to put down? Or if I buy it for 525, how much do I have to put down if I'm getting cash back right at closing, yeah. right? So you're 
you have a smaller, you'll have a smaller down payment because of that. So um, in this case, it was a big renovation project and we took those funds to go right toward our renovation budget. Did you remove all the tenants or did you keep them in or how did you, how did you go about renovating? So, so the plan initially, and this is how, because I needed a, a financial partner for this, this is how I presented it and this was the plan, was that we would go in, we would renovate six of the eight units. Um, there was the hallways needed renovating, the exterior needed renovating, it needed a new roof. Um, there was definitely room to improve uh, cash flow, so costs. Just even looking from like um, heat loss in the basement, and we spray foamed the basement, and so things like that. Um, so the plan was for those two units, they were gonna stay tenanted. Um, that isn't actually what ended up happening after about eight months of these rent we had done these renovations and we had tenanted the other two units actually gave notice that they were going to move out as well because they just sat through six months of renovations yeah. <laughs> they're like i'm out of here they probably wish they made that decision at the start of those renovations yeah. <laughs> yeah so they left so that was good we didn't expect that to happen but then it gave us the opportunity to renovate those units bring up those rents and then uh, and then refinance at that point when we could really take advantage of all of that kind of growth potential from that property. Was it mostly cosmetic renovations? Like you weren't like changing the units at all? Or was it just like upgrading everything like flooring and kitchens and, and all that kind of stuff? So it was mostly cosmetic and that was the plan was for it to be cosmetic. Um, but then with like the spray foam stuff in the basement, the new roof. Um, but we painted the whole exterior, which I think made a huge difference. And we've got, um, yeah, we spruced up the front. Uh, the interior, the halls, we, there was some horrible, like kind of fake tile flooring before that we put commercial carpet throughout. And then inside we redid the kitchens. There were small kitchens, um, but we redid them with new cabinets. Uh, the bathrooms, we did tile surround around the tub. Like it's not, it isn't super high end. It looks, I think it looks way better, but it's not super high end. There's no granite countertops. It's laminate countertops. The, we reused some of the hardwood floors, the original hardwood floors, and just got them cleaned up. So we were very careful to make sure that we weren't overspending. This isn't an area where we were going to fetch insanely high rents. Um, and the size of these units, they're not huge units. So even if we went all out on some really expensive light fixtures and countertops, we're still going to be held down just by, you know, the layouts and the size. So we were careful to make sure we weren't over renovating them. Who managed the renovation? Did you do that remotely or were you there? Like, how did it work? Especially at the beginning, I went there a fair bit. Um, I had people on site that I would communicate with every day uh, remotely, but then would go on site as well to check and choose things. Um, it worked very well having you know, kind of a point person that I could trust on site who, you know, had coordinated things on site and then I made decisions um, with him. Was your partner involved at all in the renovation or in any of the process or was he just a strictly sort of like money partner, passive investor? Completely passive money partner. And that was, that was what he wanted and that's what I wanted as well. It's, you know, that, that's kind of what I was bringing to the table anyway, is that, you know, I know where we shouldn't be wasting money where we're not going to get that back. Um, so it would be, in my case, I didn't want a partner who was saying, oh, but maybe we should go with this. It's nicer when, no, 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 we're not going to live there. This just has to be um, to kind of a standard where we're going to get the most back from our money, make the best rent that we can without spending too much and kind of have that balance. So it was important, yeah, that we were, that, that was my job and, and he was completely passive. Where did you find your joint venture partner? This one actually contacted me after I had been interviewed on a show and contacted me and, and we set up a phone call and we just kind of got on really well. He's retired, um, but he had capital and he had been operating a company that had done really well. And yeah, so that's, that's how. And so we kind of got to talking from that, met for coffee. We talked more about my deals and then, and then, yeah, move forward. So that it was cool because yeah, we didn't, it was a very kind of traditional, just money partner, formal business relationship. Do you want to talk more numbers? What do you want to take us through? Like I said, we renovated the six uh, units first and then the other two moved out. And so then we renovated those. By the time we renovated those, the other units were, you know, some of them were tenanted. So, but to keep it simple, I've separated out the renovation aspect of it and then the returns 
just as a cash flowing rental property going forward. So I've separated them out to, so it's not too confusing. Uh, let's go back to the purchase price. So the purchase price at 525 and then let, run us through the numbers from there. So yeah, purchase price was 525. Um, we needed a 30% down payment. Mm -hmm. So 30% on 525 is 157.5 and we needed 14K uh, in closing costs. So total out of pocket to purchase the property was 171.5. With that down payment of 157.5, that, uh, that leaves us with a mortgage of 367.5. So it's a 70% LTV or loan to value. So our rent out costs were 130K. So I'm gonna point out here, the purchase price was 525, but we got a 30K cash back at closing. That went toward this 130K rent out cost. We actually only had to take out of our pocket then 100K for the rent outs. So we renovated the place and then we got it appraised and the after repair value. So this is after doing all of the units, the after repair value was 850 K. That's a great jump from 525 to 850 spending 130 K. It's amazing. Yeah. So we refinanced it at 70% loan to value again. And that 70% is 595,000. Is this just because the bank wouldn't go any higher than 70% on, a, on the commercial property? Is that why? Yeah, it was commercial residential and they wanted 30% down. So then we, with that, we have to pay out the, the old mortgage, which mm -hmm. was seven five. We have to pay back ourselves for the reno. The reno was 130 less the 30K cash back. So actually we need to pay ourselves back 100K and that was with 127,500. So that's, that's what we got in hand. We then split. The partner took 64K, I took 64K. That's kind of the beauty of the Burr strategy by rent aid, um, rent refinance is that you now have the 64K that then you can go and do another deal and you can turn your money. I know you're really nice and I know you're really smart. Why did your joint venture partner agree to give you half of that money when you, when he essentially had put up, because uh, from my estimation here, He's yeah. still in the transaction for his down payment of 157.5 plus the 14K. Yes. Did you guys work this out in advance or like how did, how did that work about? So part of the renovation, um, so of that 100K that we had to take out, I put 25K in. He put 75K in. Um, but the vast majority of this project, he put the money in, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole working partner, money partner relationship, it works if the money partner sees great value in not doing any of the work. They don't, they don't want to be hands-on. They don't want to have to pick countertops and floor colors. They want to invest their money and get a better return back. And, you know, the whole negotiating the deal, finding this deal, planning um, <clears throat> how it's going to make money, how we're going to make this return, and managing the renovation takes a lot of work. So there's certainly, even though it's not monetary my contribution, it's still it's still very substantial. The plan is in five years, that's our exit strategy is five years from now, um, that we, when we sell, we will take the equity, pay him back his initial down payment and closing costs, and then split any additional equity growth, any additional profit 50-50 at that point as well. I think that's a really good point, Nicole, because I think a lot of people forget that, right? When, when, when I'm talking to potential joint venture partners and they're saying like, well, I'm gonna put all this money in <clears throat> and then you're like a, whatever your split is 50, 50 or 60, 40, mm -hmm. you know? And I think what really eases the tension sometimes is when I say, let me be very clear. When we sell the property, you get paid back first and then your initial capital. And then we split the profits 50, 50, right? I think because people think I'm going to put this money into the deal. And then all of a sudden you, you and I are 50% owners of their, that capital, and that's not the case, right? So really important that we lay that out for them, for sure. Exactly. Did you run the numbers moving forward? Like, how is this property doing for you guys? Yeah, I did. So, uh, okay, so yeah, I took it from once it's fully tenanted and then moving forward from there. Gross scheduled income, which is mm -hmm. the rent plus laundry, comes to 99800 per year. So these numbers are all annual. 99,800 per year, less vacancy. So I took out 7% for vacancy um, because of where it's located and vacancy rates right now are, are well below five. But when we bought it two years ago, they weren't. They were, I think, 6%. So I rounded up to seven. So um, $7,000. Uh, gross operating income then is 92,800. From that, we subtract the mortgage payments on the new mortgage, uh, 37,600 and subtract all the expenses. So um, the expenses are the tax, insurance, utilities, 
um, repairs and maintenance, management, and tenant, and those total 38,900. And you're left with? 16,300 in annual cash flow. So does your partner, do you have a, you have a split here? Do you guys take cash flow out of the property? We, yeah, so what we planned was we would have a reserve that would build up of 10,000 that stays in the bank account and past that we split the cash flow 50-50. Amazing. So have you run the, the four ways, your, pro, your property profits? Yeah, because uh, for those of you that have seen that other video, I'll link it here somewhere. Um, but it's the four, we, Nicole just ran through the cash flow calculation, which is another video of mine you can check out. And also the four ways to profit with rental property. So you've run those numbers for us too? Yeah. Amazing. So take us through that. Okay, so the mortgage pay down for the first year is 14,150. Passive appreciation, so I calculated that at 3% growth on the 850K, that's the new appraised value, um, works out to 25,500 per year. <clears throat> for this, because this is the year after the rent out going forward, so when I total up the cash flow, the mortgage pay down, and the passive appreciation, it totals um, just under 56,000 per year. And divided by your initial investment, I guess. Is that what you do? Yeah. So what I do is I've got, uh, we obviously not the renovation cost because that was paid back, right? So now it's divided just by that initial down payment and the 14K closing costs um, from the beginning. So 56K divided by 171,500. So that works out to 33% annual return on investment, but we split it, right? So it's 6% per year each. Amazing. Yeah, that, that one, uh, it worked out, it worked out well, especially like this was the first time I was working with this partner and it is nice when you can give them a chunk of cash right at the beginning and then everything's, you know, making money smoothly after, but I think it takes a little bit of the, the pressure off too, to do the renovation, have it be profitable, give money back and then, and then move forward. Well, and I think it's really cool what you did here. I think, you know, you found an uh, underperforming property for one. You saw some opportunity in something that a lot of other people passed up. You did a cash back on closing. Uh, you kept some tenants in the building while you did a renovation. So there's still money coming in. You renovated six units. Then the tenants happened to give their notice. You renovated the other two. Now you have a brand new, essentially all the units are brand new in the building. You refinance it, pulled back most of your capital take some for yourself, give some to your investor, get um, um, the property up and running, fully operating, and now it's doing uh, very well on an annual basis. There's a lot of elements to it, but I think it, you know, it's one of those examples where it's such a great property in terms of what it was and what it is now for you and your portfolio. Even not having any inherited tenants anymore, those are all tenants that I vetted, made sure they gave last month's rent deposit, right? We've, I've, I've kind of built the relationship with them. It's just so much nicer that it's kind of all done and everything's newer and it's, uh, it operates much more smoothly. Nicole, amazing transaction here. I love it. I'm sure if people have questions for you, they can reach out to you. I'm going to leave your information on the screen and, and drop it down in the description below. Any final thoughts on this project? Anything else you want to let people know about it? That, it, that is there anything that was truly unique that you didn't mention? Um, I think like we kind of hit on the different, the unique strategies of it. Um, I think it's good to, to get to share something like this and show people that there's so many ways to make a deal, uh, you know, make a good deal better and um, use strategies. Like there's, there's quite a few strategies all in this one deal. Yeah. Um, you know, and it also doesn't mean that every strategy is right for every deal. Maybe you go a different angle with it, with another deal, but I think it's still, it's good to, to see this. So then, you know, those questions come up when you're looking at a deal yourself. Thanks so much, Nicole. I uh, hope you have a wonderful day and we'll talk very soon. Thanks so much for having me, Darren. No problem. I hope you guys enjoyed Nicole walking us through that really creative strategy. If you did, if you can hit that like button below, you can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenvoros.com. And with that, I'll say thank you guys very much for watching. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey, and I look forward to hearing your success stories very soon.